Okay, ladies and gentlemen, germs, we had a very eventful sports week this week, and while we can't cover everything that happened, we can cover some of my favorite stories, so let's get into it. There are obvious big stories that we'll get to, but I want to jump in with my very favorite, which is that singer Michael Buble may have accidentally macrodosed at the NHL All-Star Game. <laughs> if you didn't catch it, the NHL All-Star Game happened this week, and Michael Buble was one of the celebrities that participated in the game. But when he did his post-game press conference with Will Arnett, <laughs> oh boy. He was uh, flying high, shall we say. He got pretty goofy in a lot of his post-game answers, but one of the best was when he complimented one of the interviewer's hands. He was like, you have really nice hands. And the guy was like, you are the first person to ever tell me that. And he said, it's because I'm the first real hockey fan to speak to you. Will Arnett just sort of seemed like he was stuck there for the ride, which was great. Because typically, if you're picking between Michael Buble and Will Arnett, who are we expecting to bring both hockey prowess and comedy? I'm not sure that it's Michael Buble. But at the same time, I kind of think we sleep on Michael Buble. He's had a lot of fun on the internet and he's been one of those celebrities that you enjoy watching do silly things. He did that partnership with Bubbly where he was like a crossing out the Y's and making him an E with an accent. I just think he's actually a grand old time. Eventually, after after answering a number of questions, he admitted that he thought his friend had given him a micro dose of mushrooms, but in fact was definitely not that. So did I have this on my bingo card? No, but did I have a great time? I did. And did it overshadow Justin Bieber being one of the captains? It absolutely did. And speaking of All-Star Weekend, we did get some big NBA All-Star news this week. Steph Curry is going to go head to head with Sabrina Ionescu for a three-point shootout contest at All-Star Weekend. This is very exciting to me personally because I think we're finally seeing the NBA give the WNBA a little bit of press that they need. The WNBA is great, it's fun to watch, it's enjoyable, but it doesn't get this same like push for press, which unfortunately it needs. It sucks to say it, but like if the WNBA is going to become as popular as the NBA or even get close to it, or just genuinely get popular enough that we can have more teams in a longer season, we need to see the NBA putting a lot of effort into cross-promoting the leagues. Sabrina actually holds the record for a three-point shootout contest in All-Star our weekend for NBA or WNBA and that meant that she had just beaten Steph Curry's record. And then there was a really fun rollout of Steph being mic'd up at a game recently bringing up the fact that Sabrina was the one who actually had beat him and was like, I think we're gonna have to get a challenge down so that we can finally settle this. Shortly thereafter, Sabrina accepted and it was announced that they would actually go head to head at NBA All-Star Weekend. But then there was the stickiness of the actual rules of how this contest is gonna go down. The big sticking point for a lot of people is that Sabrina will shoot from the WNBA line and Steph will shoot from the NBA line. And after a little bit of chatter, Sabrina retweeted and said, look, I'll shoot from the NBA line. To me, as someone who's been posting about this online on short form content, we're seeing that it doesn't really matter what Sabrina does and what the rules are. The people who want to be upset that women in basketball are getting a little bit of attention are going to be upset regardless. If she wins from the WNBA point line, they say it's not fair. If she wins from the NBA point line, they say it was rigged. If she loses, she's supposed to lose. If Steph loses, he's doing it to throw the game. But to me, I don't think this three point contest is for people like that. I think it's for the general public that's not watching the WNBA, that's going to watch Sabrina really kill it. And then maybe they tune in to watch her games. It's also for people like me who are already excited about Sabrina. It brings a female audience back to the NBA as well. Overall, I think it's a good PR move. And additionally, I think it doesn't matter really what the rules are. People who want to be upset are going to be upset. People who want to be excited are going to be excited. Also, this is not the first time NBA players are supporting Sabrina Ionescu and getting her out there. When her unisex basketball shoe came out with Nike, we saw a bunch of NBA players actually wear them in game, which as we know, is a huge marketing step for those types of things. All-Star Weekend's meant to be entertainment and this is going to be entertaining. So I think it's a great move. And then next we have to talk about Caitlin Clark because when are we going to talk about women's basketball? basketball and not be talking about Caitlin Clark. This week she made a huge step in her quest to beat the all-time women's NCAA scoring record and she made it up to that number two position. She is now only 66 points away from beating that record. Caitlin will most likely score those 66 points at her next game against Nebraska and the cost of those tickets has soared because so many people want to be in the building when she does this. As of today the cheapest tickets you can get on SI tickets are $147 with fees and that's just for a general admission ticket with no seat. If you want an assigned seat, you might be paying upwards of $1,000 for a seat. Those costs are way higher than you would expect for a women's basketball game, especially in college. And some of these seats cost more than it would cost you to go to an NBA game. The thing that's exciting about that is that those tickets are selling. People want to be in the building when Caitlin Clark beats this record. They want to watch her play. We already know that because there's already an entire camera dedicated to following Caitlin Clark around during the game, which is then live streamed on the internet so that you can watch an entire basketball game just focused on the star. Stuff like that is usually reserved for players like LeBron James. But Caitlin Clark is that exciting that people wanna pay that much money to watch her play and they wanna watch an entire game cam of her. There's also been a little bit of talk about whether or not she might make the 3v3 team for the Olympic Games. And overall, it's not news that Caitlin Clark is someone to watch in women's basketball, but it is sometimes exciting to break down the numbers. Okay, it's time to talk about the biggest news thing that you've seen me freaking out about on the internet all week, and that is Lewis Hamilton moving to Ferrari for 2025. Obviously, this one was a big shock, but also now that the deal points are out and a couple of other facts have come out, it really makes sense. <laughs> we already knew that there were rumors that Lewis had been talking to Ferrari. A lot of those were perpetuated by Christian Horner around the FIA gala, but when he signed his agreement with Mercedes for two years, we all kind of thought, 
okay, it makes sense. He's going to retire there, which I think is why that Ferrari move seemed like such a shock. But the biggest thing we know now is that that agreement was not actually a two-year agreement. It was a one and one which basically means he committed for the 2024 season. And then the 2025 season was an option that could be picked up by the team and by Lewis. Lewis exercised a release clause to be able to leave for 2025. And we've now found out that he actually wanted a three-year deal, which Mercedes was not willing to offer him, which to be honest is kind of shocking. The other big points that have come out is that obviously Lewis is going to be making way more money at Ferrari. His deal is reportedly worth 100 million, 80 million up front and 20 million in bonuses. But there are two other big sticking points that seem to be bigger than money to me. Sticking point number one, Ferrari is actually going to be investing a large amount of money in Lewis's other business. We can already see some additional partnerships that could be coming out of this. Ferrari has a fashion line. Lewis is very well known as a fashion person. Personally, I feel pretty confident that we'll see a Ferrari capsule from him. But beyond those investments, there's also the fact that they're going to be investing in his nonprofit, which is aimed at bringing more diversity into F1. And it seems like Total Wolf and Mercedes were not willing to make some of those same commitments. I think when you look at someone like Lewis Hamilton, who is such a goat, and you start to accept that he is basically at the end of his career. When you get to this point, you're thinking about legacy. Those legacy options are winning another championship so that he has his eighth title, saying that he got to drive for Ferrari, which is in fact a status symbol, and what kind of legacy is he going to leave for the sport when he's no longer on the grid? Those diversity initiatives are important for him. And when he's looking to retire, the other big point of news that we've seen is that Mercedes wasn't willing to commit to him being an ambassador until after 2036. Ferrari has made that commitment. To me, when we have these details, it's not really so much of a conversation of why would Lewis leave Mercedes? The question is why was Mercedes not really willing to actually do what needed to be done to keep him there? To me, now that we have all the details, it makes sense. And I'm now ultimately really excited for this move. The other big thing about this is a lot of us have been like, how is this gonna work with two world-class drivers fighting for that first seat position? But to me, something that's really exciting about this is that it kind of reminds me of some NBA moves that really changed how the sport was done. When LeBron James left Cleveland to go to Miami, he built this like big three super team that has now gone on to be a big part of the sport. You look at how these teams are building around large numbers of stars instead of just one star. Right now, the way F1 works, there's one main driver for each team and sort of a support driver. But we're looking at Lewis Hamilton and we're looking at Charles Leclerc and we know that both of them are going to have to make sacrifices for this to work. I think you're going to see the same success where you have two world-class drivers that are competing, but they're willing to work together in some ways. And sometimes one of them gets a championship and sometimes the other one does. And if this works, if this experiment of putting two world-class drivers on the same team works, we might see a shift in how F1 teams are built moving forward. So now that the dust has settled, honestly, I think this is an exciting move, not just for Lewis and Charles and Ferrari, but for the future of F1 overall. And while we're on the subject of the future of F1, let's talk about the F1 Academy drivers that have been announced this week. The Red Bull announced the three drivers they'll be supporting for F1 Academy. Two will drive for Red Bull and one will drive for Visa Cash Up RB. And we're seeing them double down on their commitment to women. We've got some really exciting drivers in the Al Kabasi sisters. In the press release, they double down on their commitment to seeing women in the sport. And also I think Visa being one of these main sponsors has shown that they are also focused on women being in the sport. When they put out their press release about Visa Cash Up RB's new name, they also included a statement on diversity where they said obviously Obviously, they would be supporting the F1 Academy drivers that Rebel was supporting, which at that time had not been announced, but also that they would be announcing the F1 Academy livery at the same event that they're announcing the F1 livery at. We're seeing some of these teams start to put young women on a much higher platform than they were before. Between Red Bull's announcements and the amount of money and time McLaren spent on those F1 Academy livery reveal videos for Bianca Bustamante, I think this F1 Academy season is going to be very exciting because those photo shoots, honestly, they look like superstars. This Bianca Bustamante video launching her car livery, the production quality, the production value is just as good as what they do for their main team. The more we see these big names respecting young women, the more that women are going to become a bigger part of this sport. So there was a lot more that happened this week, but those are the best stories for me. And I will leave you that if you were looking for something very cute, the NBA and the NHL did a video of the two number one draft picks hanging out and answering each other's questions. There is a very large height difference between these two men. <laughs> It is very adorable. It is very sweet. It's very enjoyable. So if you're looking for something else to watch and you've already looked at all the stories that I've covered today, I highly recommend just kicking back and enjoying that one. So I'm Marissa. I am your sports best friend. And if you'd like to keep up with me for daily sports news, you can subscribe right now. And I will be back with the best stories of the week.